Thank you, Mr. Rebar. And welcome to Sabbath Services, everyone, on this nice, warm, but cold day. And welcome to everyone who are staying warm in their homes on Zoom. Does that look okay? <laughs> mirror, mirror on the wall. Who shall I blame for it all? Now, before you start thinking Mr. Housen finally lost his marbles, that's not what ha is happening here. Uh, Mr. Housen still has his marbles all in his head. But have you ever had anything go wrong in your life and you look for someone to blame or you blamed it on something because of your problems. Well, I'm sure we have all done that where something has gone wrong in our lives and we blamed other people or other circumstances or other things for what we've done. For example, people have blamed the president, they'll blame Congress, they'll blame their neighbor, they may even blame their dog or bird if they have one. But what we have going on in the world is people go around blaming a lot of things and other people for their problems. And we even saw that in the Bible. I mean, it didn't take very long for us to start seeing the blame game being played in the Bible. Look at Genesis. We all know the story with Adam and Eve, where God told Adam and Eve, you should not eat the forbidden fruit that's in the midst of the garden. So what happened? They ate the forbidden fruit. God came along walking on a nice Sabbath day. And he asked, so why did you eat the forbidden fruit? Well, Adam, he looked around, he saw Eve, the only other human, and says, this woman you gave me, that's her fault. And then Eve looked around and she didn't see any other humans at that time. So she looked at the serpent and she said, that serpent um, is to blame. That serpent made me eat it. And then the serpent looked around and went, <laughs> And then we saw Cain blame Abel for God not accepting his offering. He thought that, well, it was Abel's fault, so I had to kill him because that's why God's mad at me. We even saw the children of Israel. They blamed God for all their misery in the wilderness. They said, it's God's fault that we are suffering for 40 years in the wilderness and that we can't have fresh water and we are so hungry all the time, even though I don't know why they thought they were hungry all the time. And they had quail, they had manna every morning. They didn't really have to do much cooking. I mean, they had it pretty easy, but they still, still found something to complain about and blame God for it and Moses. But really, who should we blame for our actions? Who should we blame when we make a wrong decision in life? Should we blame other people? Should we blame God? Should we blame it on circumstances beyond our control? I want to tell you a story of a real person, which I'm sure you have all heard, about who he blamed. His name is Nelson Mandela, who was born in South Africa in 1918. And he grew up at that time in South Africa that was a racist society. He became involved in politics at a very young age. And he was kicked out of university in 1940 for organizing a student strike. When the South African government banned the ANC party in 1960, Nelson Mandela decided to go underground and form the arm wing of the ANC. Basically, he studied guerrilla warfare and he used it against the South African government for destruction. And at that time, he blamed the government. He blamed the government forced him to take up the armed resistance. And this armed resistance of the ANC killed many people. It killed many civilians in South Africa. It was so bad, it was labeled a terrorist organization in the United States, the UK, and Canada. And ANC was banned in all those three countries. He was also labeled, as you would guess, a terrorist in South Africa. He was looked upon as a communist here in the Western world. And in, here in this country, we even put him on the terrorist watch list. Basically, my point is, Nelson Mandela, he, he was not a very nice guy back then. He was, he, was, he was a bad guy. We would call him a bad guy. So he finally was arrested in 1962. And in 1964, he was sentenced to life in prison on Robben Island after being convicted of treason. 
He was finally released from prison in 1989 at the age of 71. Now, I know when I was a kid, I thought, especially in the 80s, wow, 71 is so old. But Nelson Mandela didn't think that. He wrote that when he left prison at age 71, he felt his life was starting all over again. After being in prison for that long, and he was playing the blame game before he went to prison, at age 71, he felt like he was starting life all over again. So who did he blame after he got released from prison? Did he blame the South African government for what happened to him? Did he blame the whites for being such racist there in South Africa? Here's a quote from Nelson Mandela. And you tell me, who was he blaming? He said, I am not a saint. Unless you think of a saint as a sinner who keeps on trying. In a speech in Houston at Rice University in 1999, Nelson Mandela said this, I'm an ordinary human being with weaknesses, some of them fundamental. And another quote from Nelson is, there are few misfortunes in the world that you cannot turn into a personal triumph if you have the iron will and the necessary skill. So who was he blaming in those quotes? I didn't hear him blame the whites. I didn't hear him blame the South African government. He was blaming himself. He clearly understood when he said those quotes that he was a sinner with weaknesses and he acknowledged it. And he knew at the age of 71 that when he walked out of prison, he had a chance to start his life anew. He humbled himself to know he was just an ordinary human being and he could not blame other people for his situation. Like I mentioned earlier, he wasn't a nice guy in the beginning. Imagine this, he was a man who went through so much in his life because of his actions. It was him that got himself in trouble. And other people's actions toward him, he decided to eventually change his life around while in prison and become the nicest, most influential human being at the time around the world. And he did not blame others. Jim Rohn, who was a motivational speaker and author, he had the following quote. He said, you must take personal responsibility. You cannot change the circumstances, the seasons, or the wind. But you can change yourself. That is something you have charge of. Think about that. That's so profound. Can you change your circumstances around you? Can you change the seasons? I mean, there's still seasons. We still have winter here in Ohio. You can't change that. Can you change the wind? How hard the wind is blowing? No. Only one I ever saw it change the wind was God. But you know who you can change? You can change yourself. And let's see what the Bible says about us blaming others or circumstances for our problems. Let us look at the example of Samson. Samson was a judge. In Judges 13.5, it says he was, he was born to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So no razor was supposed to come upon his head. In the beginning of his life, he did do great things to defeat the Philistines, but eventually he had a very big weakness, his love for women. And he fell in love with a woman named Delilah. And she tricked him into telling him his secret about cutting his hair. And so she told the other Philistines and they cut his hair and he had his eyes put out and he was captured. But who did he blame? Who did he say was responsible? Did he blame God? Did he blame Delilah? Turn with me to Judges 16 and verse 26. Judges 16, 26. So he just had his eyes put out. He was taking his prisoner into this big, huge temple. And he knows he's being mocked. So verse 26 then Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. In fact, there were about 3,000 men and women on the roof who watched while Samson performed. Now here's the key verse. Tell me, who is he blaming? Who is he saying is taking responsibility for his situation? Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, 
Remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray. Just this once, O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might. The temple fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he killed all his life. Can you tell in that scripture, was he blaming God? I don't think he was blaming God. How can you be blaming God and be asking him to deliver you and help you get your strength back? Sounds like to me he was taking responsibility for his actions. It was his own decision making that led him to his circumstance that he became involved in. And the, one of the reasons the scripture was probably wrote, written for us to show how he accepted personal responsibility for his situation. Let's look at another example of someone in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul. What did Paul say about taking personal responsibility? Turn with me to Galatians chapter 6, and verses 7 through 9. Galatians 6, 7 through 9. In the New King James Version, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Now, these are scriptures we've all read before. Um, sometimes when you read it a lot, it loses its luster. It loses its meaning. You don't understand its meaning. So let's go to the New Living Translation to get a different spin on these words. It says this in the New Living Translation. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. So that makes it clear. What you plant, if you plant good things, you're going to harvest good things. You're going to reap good things. If you plant bad things, you're going to harvest. What it says here is decay and death. So he's saying we got to not give up and go in God's way. We cannot give up on God's way of life because we will eventually reap the reward, which is to live an eternal life. Paul understood this very well, and believe me, he did. If you know his history, he also was not a very nice guy in the beginning, just like Nelson Mandela wasn't a nice guy. Do you remember in the book of Acts where he was persecuting the Christians? Do you remember him consenting to the deacon Stephen's death? He, he wanted to get rid of all the Christians in the world, and he didn't care how he got rid of them. If it meant to stone them to death, let them be stoned. But he acknowledged, after God called him, that he had sinned in the past. And he also acknowledged he had no right to God's gift of eternal life. He acknowledged that he was unworthy to be an apostle. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 9. We'll see it from Paul's own writing. First Corinthians 15 and verse 9. You tell me, who does Paul blame for what happened to him early on in life? Verse 9, for I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He understood that very well. As we approach this Passover season, we understand that the season is about Jesus Christ being our Savior and dying for our sins so that we can have eternal life. We need to accept Jesus died for us and not blame other people for our 
what happened to us or so other circumstances or what we are in. We need to repent, obey God, and acknowledge God. Mandela understood he had himself to blame for what happened to him in prison, and he changed. We can use Mandela's example, we can use Samson's example, we can use Paul's example on how to accept responsibility for our actions. The only reason we are here today is because of God's grace. God has given us his gift to be here. He's given us grace to be here in his church because we don't deserve this. He does it because he loves us and we just have to accept personal responsibility. Eric Thomas, a motivational speaker said this, stop the blame game, look out the window and in the mirror. As we examine ourselves for the upcoming Passover, we need to look in the mirror and say, I blame myself and I accept personal responsibility. God, please help me since I am a sinner. We all need to look into the mirror.